Hello, today we are with Arijit Sen. Arijit Sen is a graphic novelist. He created India's first graphic novel, River of Stories. He also makes murals, installation art artworks, and many other things. Thank you for having us here. Pleasure, Nikhil. Uh, let's start with uh, by talking about Rohit Vemula's suicide. Mm. You created this artwork mm. on Facebook, yeah. where you reimagined uh, a Manu Smriti. Mm. Cover mm. and you created a face using half of Manu Joseph's face mm. and half of Smriti Rani's face. Mm. Why did you do that? Um, I couldn't resist the pun. Uh, I'm I'm a visual artist and uh, as a as a graphic artist and novelist, I am always interested in the play of word and image, and it was just too irresistible. To have Smriti Rani and Manu Joseph uh, sort of taking this sort of uh, uh, almost Brahminical view of uh, an event which is very tragic and which actually brings out uh, the kind of deep rooted and in in the eyes of many upper caste and privileged Indians an invisible tragedy that has carried on in our society for thousands of years. And there is a, there is a, to my mind, the kind of expressions, let's say Manu's article. I mean, what provoked me actually was Manu's article about um, how this it being a depression issue, and uh, that, that depression. it's about depression, and uh, it was such such a kind of a uh, limited, foolish, even I would say malicious, mischievous uh, attempt at uh, uh, sort of uh, trivializing it into uh, something. Uh, uh, or refusal to look at the broader context of, of, of Rohit's suicide. I mean, Rohit is not the first, and sadly, he will not be the last uh, um, oppressed person who has to had to uh, take his or her life in response to something which is like a, a ongoing um, vicious sort of a oppressive system that they have to fight every day of their lives, um, and. Uh, so to try to kind of pass it off in that way, it made me angry. When I read that article, I was really angry and it was, but I didn't want to react to uh, a tragedy like Rohit's with just uh, immediate thing, but I couldn't resist the, the fact that there's this man whose name is Manu and there's this uh, uh, you know, human resources minister whose name is Smriti and the two of them are uh, part of this ongoing unfolding of the, um, Brahmin hierarchy in our country, uh, upper caste hierarchy, I should say. Mm, and uh, so I thought, okay, I let me just put that out. It was too good to pass up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in uh, Banda, in the Union Minister uh, Bandaru Dattatreya's letter of complaint mm. to Smriti Rani, mm. he refers to Rohit's politics mm. as anti-national. Mm. Aren't these labels thrown around so casually these days? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, it's become, it's almost become like a uh, um, one of the favorite uh, um, accusations to make today. Uh, and whether you're talking about uh, people asking for their rights in Kashmir, or you're talking about just, I mean, I'm get, I get labeled anti-national all the time. Uh, so it's, uh, or it, you're talking about someone who refuses to stand up when everyone's standing up at the national anthem. Everything is anti-national. I mean, is our nationalism so fragile that it, it gets threatened by the smallest of acts. And uh, to consider someone like uh, a, an event like that of Rohit's suicide as uh, somehow uh, related to activities, I mean, people have been talking about the fact that he spoke up against the hanging of uh, Yaqub Memon. Come on, I mean, I spoke up against that. I mean, there's so many of us in this country who don't believe that the state should have the right to end somebody's life, regardless of what uh, crime uh, the person might be accused of. And uh, I think here, uh, so obviously that makes a huge number of people in this country so-called anti-national. Now the idea of nationalism is getting, uh, becoming so compressed and so tightened and so small that it's excluding more and more people from its ambit. And that's a very, very dangerous trend. Right. Yeah. So I'd, I'd kind of um, be very, very critical of people, uh, politicians and others who sort of throw this word around. Right. 
your satire is very provocative and you've recently been censored by Facebook. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Um, I mean, uh, at one level, if somebody finds your work so troublesome that they have to go to lengths to get it out, right. uh, to strike it off or to re remove it, uh, I think I'll take that as a compliment because it shows that my work really provokes them. And um, at another level, of course, I am uh, troubled by this. It's the same process of, of the kind of shrinking of our spaces to express, to dissent, to speak out about stuff that we feel strongly about. There's an attempt both at a kind of, uh, at the level of the authorities, the government, and also at the kind of level of just communities. I mean, people uh, are becoming um, perhaps uh, I would say many people are becoming much more narrow in their thinking, much right. less accepting of diverse opinion. Right. There is a need to sort of somehow straightjacket everyone and everything into one school of thought. Right. And uh, this is a very dangerous thing. And uh, so at, at one level, I find it amusing. I'm also uh, delighted that uh, somebody right. gets uh, uh, troubled enough to uh, do something like this and the fact that it evokes a response from other people who right. who who's, who have uh, been sharing my work in defiance of you know Facebook's uh, kind of response right. mm. so yeah so I would say it's uh, that is something that's important that we all continue uh, and I intend to continue putting up more posts right. that right. people find troublesome your last artwork which was censored yeah was called she came in through the window yeah. and it had a certain amount of nudity yeah uh, do you think that's the reason why it was censored uh, the reason facebook took it off was at least on the face of it a series of reports from offended people right. uh, who reported my image right my point here is when it comes to sexuality nudity again these are subjects that we as a society want to sweep under the carpet right uh, we why are do you happy think so? Why, why, why do you think that's the case? Whether it's M. F. Hussein's art, <laughs> yeah. art yeah. or yours yeah. in this case, yeah. uh, why do we have such a problem with nudity expressed uh, on canvas? This is uh, something that I think um, uh, all of us uh, in India today should really be thinking about, because um, we're okay with all kind of uh, uh, misogynistic, uh, uh, violent, anti-women depictions through songs in Bollywood movies through right. uh, and through all the mainstream porn that exists online which everybody has access to all the time right uh, and they tried to censor that they, it didn't work out they, they were trying to censor but at the same time it's not really uh, what I'm trying to say is that it's not it's not coming from a place that's that need to censor it's not coming from a place of accepting uh, the uh, the let's say the beauty and the joy of uh, human relationships of sexuality of alternative sexualities mm, of uh, we don't we have a rule that criminalizes gay sex I mean uh, we are a very backward society when it comes to that and uh, I, I put out some of my what I would call erotic artworks uh, uh, to uh, to actually create not just protest against uh, the clampdown on uh, on on these subjects right or the silence around these subjects, right. but also to mm, put out positive imagery about it, to mm. show that sexuality, uh, nudity, love, are very wonderful things that we need to celebrate rather than... Doesn't have to be taboo. Uh, yeah, doesn't have to be taboo and doesn't have to be uh, treated in this sort of, oh, we quietly go and uh, you know uh, check out porn websites. There, there has to be al al alternatives. Sure. Um, the satirist has traditionally been feared because if you could yeah. place uh, a clever satire upon someone, you would destroy them for life and maybe long after they're gone too. <laughs> but today, uh, you have uh, stand-up comedians having FIRs registered mm. against them mm. and cartoonists being sent to jail. Is this out of fear too? Yes, absolutely. This is totally the fear of, of dissent, of, of a kind of, let's say, satire involves implies a uh, sort of uh, mm, intelligence you know satire always comes from a place of intelligence i mean true satire uh, and this intelligence is feared by those who 
who actually have, uh, they're like the bullies, right? They're not really smart. They just have some means, uh, you know, some weapons or some ability to clamp down or some ability to shut people up. And that's what they can use in right. response to that. Right. Uh, when it comes to political satire, the first thing we think about is uh, R.K. Lakshman's political cartoons, maybe. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about the current state of um, political cartoons in newspapers? I mean, they've pretty much disappeared. And uh, uh, it's a reflection, I suppose, of, of our times as well. Uh, yeah, from I grew up looking at Lakshman's cartoons being often understanding the events of the day or some Im uh, important things from his response to it you know i mean i couldn't as a young person i couldn't be bothered to decipher the language of the p politicians and what speech they made and what they said <laughs> which is what our media mostly focuses on and uh, politics is not about what the politicians do politics is much is a much bigger thing i mean uh, what politicians do is some kind of a little bit of uh, they have the power to uh, influence the lives of many people and their actions and their uh, 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 activities uh, are political in the sense that th their decisions and their actions uh, change uh, things in a big way. But at the same time, a lot of the time, uh, this so-called um, politics between the right and the left and the center and Congress and BJP and all of that is, uh, we, are, we are in India is, are too obsessed with that. I mean, instead of looking at the larger idea of politics, what yeah. is politics, what is oppression, what is uh, systemic oppression in society. I mean, uh, Rohit's case is an example. We're not really looking at those issues. We're just looking at what this politician said or that one said, and uh, they're basically having a conversation between themselves in the sense, taking points off each other, uh, trying to score something. And we get lost in that instead of understanding the deeper, uh, much more important context. And so I think uh, that's what's been happening with political cartoons. They've sort of disappeared. Uh, given way entirely to uh, this notion of po uh, politician speak. You know, to me, it's a very, uh, the media now are very much kind of corporatized. They are, they don't kind of, um, mm, I mean, I, I think most of them don't really is have an independent voice. Is that where the problem voice. starts, you think, because it's a bit corporatized? Uh, that is one of the things. I think that's a major thing. But at the same time, I think, yeah, uh, the fact is that the corporates also are very beholden. I mean, the nexus between the corporates and the and political interests have become much closer. Sure. And and that's what's led the media to become a much more uniform sort of a space where uh, actually, I mean, I've had uh, like right now I'm um, talking about stuff that concerns me. Sure. I've had uh, interviews uh, where things I said have been bleeped out. Uh, and really? yeah, and made it made into a sort of palatable. All the difficult things are out. Sure. Only the broad generalizations yeah. are left in. You don't have to hold back today. <laughs> you won't be. I, I, I never hold back. But uh, you know, the editors sure. finally sure. decide what to do. But um, anyway, I mean, uh, I use these opportunities to be able to speak, and right. I yeah, I'm sure you guys will not edit me out. No, no, <laughs> we I, we promise we won't edit you out. Already. Okay. <laughs> Tell us about Punjaban. Was that the very first time you were uh, censored by Facebook? It wasn't the very first time, but uh, uh, it's one of the recent episodes and uh, it drew a lot of attention. I'm, I'm happy for that because right. what happened is uh, I, I use, uh, like I was saying earlier, that the mainstream media have more or less blipped out uh, the possibility of dissent and of visual uh, uh, sort of satire of any kind. I mean, we don't no longer had the kind of cartoonists uh, like Lakshman or like uh, Abu Abraham who could interpret uh, politics in this very strong and powerful way for us. Uh, and in response to that, I decided to start using social media as my newspaper. And where I didn't have an editor, I didn't have deadlines, I would just respond and create works to th things and situations. Like, for example, the Manu Joseph uh, piece uh, that I did. In, uh, which was in response directly to having read his article in the morning. Mm, uh, so I do that a lot. I, I, I create works specifically in response to something I might come across on the social media itself or elsewhere, and then put it out uh, into the public sphere through Facebook. 
and um, so then uh, I put out this artwork called Punjaban, uh, which shows a woman who is dressed in a uh, in a like a patiala salwar, and she seems to be uh, she's standing in front of a mirror. She seems to be getting dressed for a wedding because she's got her uh, high heel shoes on and everything. But her uh, she's bare on top, and uh, she's sort of uh, struggling with her nada, which has gotten stuck. And uh, so you can, in the mirror, you can see her uh, semi-nude from the front, and um, and she has a whip lying on the floor near her. And uh, this created quite a bit of consternation. Within like 15 minutes of my putting it up, I started getting notifications from Facebook saying your post has been reported it, for nudity, for inappropriate content, etc. Et and so I ignore it and. But what I did was I, I on that same post. Meanwhile, it was getting liked and shared sure. at a rapid rate. Sure. And uh, I put out a thing saying that uh, I've got this report, and it might get pulled off. So, those of you who would like to uh, take it, I mean, I said anybody's free to download it. And uh, in fact, if you want me to inbox it to you, I'll inbox it to you as well, and you should share it from your upload it from your own pages. And then that's right. what started happening. Right. My post got pulled down, right. but people started sharing it. Right. And then their posts, uh, some of them got pulled down. And uh, then uh, somebody said in solidarity with Orijit, I'm putting up, the whole idea was to test Facebook's sort of standards and morality, which they claim sure. to have all written down in black and white. And which says, by the way, that uh, artworks containing nudity are not uh, subject to being banned. Right. This but they took it down anyway. Yeah, they, they specifically say this, but they right. took it down in response to these yeah. uh, reports. And then um, people started putting up famous nudes from art history, you know, from Modigliani to Michelangelo right. to this to that. Right. Uh, and people started sharing. It became really interesting over the next four or five days. It was like a huge, it really caught on. It mm -hmm. became like a huge online festival of nudity and art. And uh, in fact, it was an amazing yeah. thing because people were sharing works that they loved and that meant something for them. Um, it became an educative thing as well, because for me, I mean, as an artist, there's, I came across so many artworks I'd never <laughs> sort of uh, seen before. And uh, it, was, it was wonderful. And that whole thing ended up causing a much bigger kind of a, uh, exposure for my artwork, as well as for the idea of nudity and right. uh, erotic art um, you know, on, on, the, on Facebook. Right. And of course, when you're putting up Michelangelo or Magliani, Facebook can't put it off because it's everywhere. Right. Uh, so, uh, so it also exposed uh, the kind of hypocrisy that uh, Facebook practices. Yeah. And um, in the end, they restored it. Uh, oh, really? The, uh, Facebook okay. actually restored it. Did you uh, get an apology? No apology, but suddenly one morning I see that my post is back up. Okay, okay. Uh, and uh, so yeah, that was like a minor battle one. Right. You never pull punches, whether you're expressing your feelings about Modi, Prime Minister Modi, or Mohan Bhagwat. Yeah. Um, but let's say uh, there's a threat of jail mm. looming over your head mm. in the future. Yeah. Would you tone down? No, I've already had such that threats. Oh, really? I've been you had FIRs registered against you? Uh, I've had threats of FIRs. I mean, I haven't actually had one. Uh, I was woken up at four, recently at four in the morning right. by a call saying that you're going to get arrested in half an hour, uh, pretending to be a well-wisher, he said, get lost, disappear, switch your phone off, they're coming for you. At four in the morning, and my daughter is sleeping in the house with me, my wife is there, my mother is there, and I'm saying, no, I'm, I can't disappear now, I mean, what, what, I mean, how can I do that? I'm mean, okay, I'll just wait it out and see what happens. And then, as soon as it got a little, uh, like, six or whatever, when I could call someone reasonably, I called. And it was quite scary. I mean, it was uh, every time I'd hear a car, I'd think, okay, this is the cops coming. Uh, and I live in Gurgaon, which is in Haryana, which is a BJP ruled state. And uh, so, um, but anyway, I mean, I ended up speaking to friends. Nobody came. Uh, I uh, spoke to a, a very good lawyer friend. So she advised me that I should, if at all, I have to get, I should take a, such a threat seriously because there's no way to assess whether it's real or not, but uh, you should try and kind of, so it gave me some clues as to how to deal with that situation. But I think that what the, the episode I'm talking about 
was good for me, like a dress rehearsal for something that might happen. At least I get a sense. I I'm prepared in a way, right. as as much as one can be. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean that happens, and um, no, I'm not going to be uh, closing down my creativity or my voice for for that. Great. Uh, let's get to the lighter side of things. You recently um, exhibited some installation artworks mm. at Jaipur Literary Festival. Yeah. Tell us about what you did. Um, I was invited to uh, actually show some of, as a graphic novelist, uh, there's a gallery called Ojas Arts and they usually display works of artists at the liter literature festival every year. So they approached me and said, would you like to mm, show some of your work? So then uh, when I looked, uh, when I saw uh, online the photographs of the site and all of that, I said, okay, this looks like a kind of place where three dimensional things would work more interestingly uh, than just my graphic works. And so I proposed, I had this idea and I proposed it. And I said, I'll, I'll create something specially for the festival, uh, which, I mean, I'm, I'm, I love these kind of characters from literature and cinema and as a graphic novelist myself, I'm kind of, sure. uh, you know, I, I have a lot of relationship with the idea of characters. And um, so I have this bunch of, it was quite difficult. Once uh, I started working, it became quite difficult to, I went through this whole sort of mm, book prize process where uh, I first made a long list. Sure. <laughs> then from that I made a short list. Sure. And from that short list I finally selected six that really sure. I wanted to work with. And I created them using, with my studio, with my team of really skilled and talented uh, uh, artists and craftspeople. How long did it take you to create that? So over about four weeks. It was quite intense. Sure. But um, I had this idea of making these tall, 10 foot tall structures. Right. And using everyday materials like bamboo, wire, fabric, paper, found objects. Uh, I, I like to create art that people connect with in the sense that the, you know, it's not like putting up a bronze sculpture or a fiberglass thing or where the material and the process itself is uh, in a way opaque, uh, in the sense that for the average layperson encountering it, it's a mystery as to how this is made. It just is an object and uh, it's beautiful or whatever, but nevertheless, they have no direct connection with that material or that process or all of that. So I wanted to actually make stuff with everyday things, which everybody could see, oh yeah, this is, this is paper, this is wire, this is fabric, stuff that we live with in our lives, you know? Uh, and so that's how I started working on it, and uh, it was quite, you know, f it was really fun actually. Did you Intense, get a lot of good fun. feedback for it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's been received really well, and it's be, it was great to see so many people just loving it, enjoying it, sure. hanging around it, yeah. uh, of course taking selfies. After a point the selfie thing got a little over the top, you know, people were trying to do all kind of things, getting more and more creative with their selfies. Like really? <laughs> Like there's one of this girl, Little Red Riding Hood. Uh, I took the character from Roald Dahl's version of that poem, where she actually shoots the wolf. Sure. So I had her like this, with this little girl with the uh, whole cape and everything, in this fr frilly dress and all of that. But she's got this big gun and she's right. sort of pointing it like yeah. that. And there's this fellow, I see him, he's trying to get his hand, his head between her hands and hold the gun and pose for herself. I said, what are you doing? I mean, come on. <laughs> this whole fragile stuff. Yeah, it's so, not a mannequin. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. So anyway, that's that's one end of it. But there were mostly people were really, really appreciative and it was fun. Right. I mean, I love putting art out into public spaces and sure. rather than within the confines of galleries right. or kind of controlled, defined uh, spaces right. to view art. Right. I mean, that has its own, obviously, its own thing because uh, that way you can show off your art to the best and the most controlled way that you want to. But uh, in a public space, it's m so much more lively, exciting, fun. And I love to reach out. I mean, the guards at Diggy Palace, when we were putting it up, were so excited by these things. They would keep coming and talking about it. And I can uh, imagine. Yeah, so uh, to me, that matters a lot. I mean, if, if the guards at Diggy Palace love it, then that makes my day. Sure. <laughs> Your very first graphic novel, and is the only one so far, right? Hmm. River of Stories. Hmm is going to be reprinted. Yeah. Um, any, uh, would you like to tell us when we can get our, get our hands? I'm working on it book? at the moment. Okay. Um, I oh, hate deadlines. 
uh, I mean, I do work to deadlines, not that I don't. Sure. But mostly, like in a case like this, I won't give impose a deadline on myself. But yeah. it will happen this year, for sure. Sure. Mm, it's just the beginning of the year, so I can confidently say that okay. within this year it's going to happen. So listen up, Origit Sen fans. It's coming out this year. Yeah. <laughs> Origit Sen, thanks so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. If you enjoyed that, click up here to support us and down here to subscribe. Be sure to check out our older episodes and the other stuff we do like Can You Take It, I Agree, panel discussions, comics and animations and much, much more.